Remember last year's superconductor news? Ranga Diaz from the University of Rochester in New York claimed he had found a material that was superconducting at room temperature, though he had to put it under pressure. Well, it now looks like not only is the stuff not superconducting, but that it wasn't an accidental deception, it was a deliberate one. Some people from his lab have now spoken out. Let's have a look. This is not the story of LK99, the floating Korean miracle crumbles. Those turned out to be not superconducting either, but to me it looks like an honest mistake. No, this is the story of Ranga Diaz, who made big headlines last year by claiming to have a room temperature superconductor that works at 10,000 bar, that's 10,000 times atmospheric pressure, which some outlets cheerfully reported as moderate pressure. To me, a 10,000 bar seems like a lot of pressure. But maybe it's normal in New York. What do I know? To be fair, though, this pressure is much easier to reach than the low temperatures that the already known superconductors need. And if Diaz had been right, that'd have been a big deal indeed. A superconductor is a material without electric resistance. If we had a material that was superconducting in an everyday environment, that'd be big because it could dramatically improve the efficiency of the entire electric grid and other electronic devices. But when the news broke, Diaz already had some of a reputation. Three years earlier, a team also led by Diaz published a paper, also in Nature, about a supposed superconductor breakthrough. The paper was retracted two years later after other scientists raised doubts about the data analysis. When Diaz's lab came out with the new supposed discovery, many of his colleagues were highly skeptical. The biggest issue with the paper was the graph that shows the drop of resistivity to zero, which is the whole mark of superconductivity. This graph relied on a noise subtraction that might have subtracted a little bit too much. Within a matter of days, several people pointed out that without this noise subtraction, the neat drop of the resistivity disappeared. This discussion drew attention to another paper he had published earlier on PRL and which was then also retracted due to data anomalies. Some raised allegations that Diaz plagiarized parts of his PhD thesis. Late last summer, the Wall Street Journal reported that several of Diaz's students who had co-authored the new paper decided to ask Nature to retract the paper because they said Diaz misrepresented the data. According to Science Magazine, Diaz got wind and tried to stop them by having a lawyer send cease and desist letters. After seeking legal advice, the students did it anyway. Briefly afterwards, the University of Rochester stripped Diaz of his lab and students and started an investigation into scientific misconduct. It was his fourth. In early September, Nature put an editor's note on his paper from March saying that the reliability of the data is in question. In November, the paper was retracted. An investigation by Nature magazine has now revealed that several former graduate students in his lab who requested anonymity were concerned that something was amiss already when Diaz published the first paper in 2020. This had been just a preliminary result that they couldn't reproduce and it shouldn't have been published. That's what the student said. But an investigation by the American Physical Society found that it was actually worse and that Diaz had likely fabricated data for the paper. The students' worries only increased as they were working on the second paper. When they discovered that their measurements were inconsistent with each other or systematic errors too high to draw conclusions, Diaz seemed to not listen and rushed the second paper to publication. He gave gave his students less than 12 hours to comment. Two weeks ago, the University of Rochester concluded their fourth investigation into Diaz's research, and this time they found that he had committed research misconduct. This is likely to be the end of the story and of Diaz's career, but it's worth reflecting on what went wrong here.
One problem that stands out in this case is that the students knew something was off years ago, but had no one to turn to. And as they told Nature, even as the research was under investigation, no one came to ask them. Students and also postdocs are highly dependent on their supervisor's good opinion. For one, they often risk losing funding or at least work that they put into a project, and also because they need the connections and often also the letters of recommendation. The professors in return operate with little or no oversight. It's also rather typical that the university did several investigations into research misconduct that at first found nothing. The issue there was likely that they didn't look very hard and they were probably hoping for people to forget about it. But why do scientists do this in the first place? Well, I have no insights into this particular case, but it sounds eerily similar to the story of Jan Hendrik Schön, another superconductor scandal in the early 2000s. Schön was an up and coming star physicist working for Bell Labs. Schön's team reported they could turn semiconductors into superconductors. It was amazing, groundbreaking, revolutionary. In 2001, he won the Breakthrough of the Year award. But in 2002, an investigation by Stanford University and Bell Labs found that Schön had tampered with fabricated distortion and deleted data in 16 out of the 24 papers they examined. He was subsequently fired from Bell Labs. I know that this sounds outrageous, and of course it is, but I've always found this story more tragic than upsetting. Because as the book Plastic Fantastic relates, Schoen started out being convinced that he was onto something, just trying to make the data look a little prettier, so that others would understand how amazing this was so that he could continue working on it. And surely, soon enough, the real data would confirm his hunch. Except reality didn't comply and he got stuck in his deception. Did the same thing go on in Dia's case? Maybe we'll soon find out. Of course, hope alone doesn't explain all of it. Part of the problem is certainly also a craving for fame. And yet another part of the problem is that scientists often can't afford failure. Failure means they'll lose funding, they'll lose their lab, they'll lose everything they worked for. You get to the point, as the great philosopher Eminem put it, Success is my only option. Yes, scientists know how it is to be. Climate change has a lot of weird consequences. It's supposedly ruining the taste of beer, makes goats shrink and flights bumpier. But I didn't see this one coming. It's making the days longer. Let's have a look. Yes, so this new study, which just appeared in Nature, says that the melting of ice on the poles redistributes so much mass towards the equator that the rotation of Earth is noticeably slowing down. It's like the famous ice dancer stretching out her arms to slow down her spin. Because of this, the next leap second to adjust for the somewhat irregular rotation of Earth will have to come three years later than the original prediction said. It'll also be the first ever negative leap second. The author says that if one takes this effect of the mass distribution from the poles melting into account, one can also conclude that the rotation of the core of Earth has slowed more than previously estimated. This is because angular momentum of the entire system is conserved. The more the core slows down, the more the solid crust speeds up. But the distribution of the ice also slows it down, so the core must have sped it up more. I hope I got this right. It, my head is spinning. I find this completely fascinating because you really didn't think we little humans could actually affect the spin of Earth. Woohoo! But actually, this isn't the first time we've done something like that. A study which appeared last year found that we've also changed the tilt of Earth's axis. The scientists figured this out by carefully tracking the spots that our planet revolves around, which I assure you are not Kate Middleton and Elon Musk but rather two places on the north and south ends of our planet called the rotational poles. Over the past 100 years, the Earth's rotational pole has slowly but consistently moved westwards along this green line every year. But this changed three decades ago when that drift began to slow and head eastward, ending up along the red line 
labeled ops. The authors say that that's our doing. It's happened because we have pumped massive amounts of water out of the ground and used them for irrigation elsewhere. In the period between 1993 and 2010, we have redistributed more than 2,000 gigatons of groundwater, which shifted Earth's poles an average of 4.36 centimeters eastward per year, adding up to a total of 80 centimeters. The most visible consequence of this steady eastward drift is TikTok. Another peculiar consequence of climate change that doesn't get the attention it deserves is global stilling. Sounds like a euphemism for the Twitter exodus, but actually refers to the decrease of wind speeds that might bring trouble for countries who have banked on wind power. I say might bring trouble because so far the evidence is somewhat unclear. But the general effect leading to this global stilling is reasonably well understood. There are two major causes of the wind patterns on our planet. One is the rotation of Earth, the other is that the air is warmer near the equator and colder towards the poles. The thing is now that climate change is warming the poles faster than the equator, which decreases the temperature difference and calms down the winds. Because of this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that winds will slow down globally in the coming decades. By 2100, they say average annual wind speeds could drop by up to 10%. Climate change isn't the only contributing factor. Increases in surface roughness from cities also slow down winds. Indeed, the changes in global wind patterns could also, wait for it, affect how fast the Earth spins. It's because the angular momentum of the entire system, Earth's mantle core water and atmosphere, is conserved. If the atmosphere goes around less fast, then the Earth's mantle have to speed up. Now we're talking about changes of microseconds per day, so not like we'll get to sleep in forever after, but you get to watch a few more of those microsecond videos that are coming up any day now, I'm sure. Elon Musk is offering a cash prize for anyone who can come up with a good use case for a quantum computer. Isn't that basically admitting that no one has a good use case? Let's have a look. A few weeks ago, Musk teamed up with Google and the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator to launch an X Prize for quantum applications. It's a three year, $5 million global contest. They're looking for ways to use quantum computers to solve real world challenges that benefit society. Specifically, they want to focus on sustainability and social impact. That focus makes a lot of sense because the potential applications application of quantum computers that's attracted the most interest is the optimization of financial assets. And the reason it's attracted the most interest is that it could make some people very rich very quickly. If anyone knew how to do it sooner rather than later, I don't think a share of those five million dollars would be all that much of an incentive. Okay, but let's not be cynical. I actually think that this is coming from a good place. Yes, I believe in Elon. Because when I look at the kind of applications of quantum computers that are usually being discussed, they're all incredibly vague. Something with fertilizers that'll feed the starving children of Africa, or something with better solar panels that we can plaster all over Africa after the thing with the fertilizers didn't work out. I've heard this so often. But just how exactly is that supposed to happen? Basically, the contest asks people to come up with concrete ways of using quantum computers and give their ideas to Elon Musk and Sundar Pichai. I mean, there's a reason these guys are rich. But let's not be cynical. Instead, let's look at exactly what they want. They either want a new quantum algorithm, a new application for a known algorithm, or a way to speed up an existing algorithm. In all three cases, they ask for a demonstration of quantum advantage. And what they mean by quantum advantage, I think, is a demonstration that with such an algorithm, a quantum computer could in principle one day beat a conventional computer if quantum computers 
ever get large enough, which in practice might never happen. But let's not be cynical. So this contest is looking for maths, basically, lots of maths. That makes sense in that mathematics is considerably cheaper than superconducting circuits or atoms and laser traps. Honestly, I'm tempted to think about it. I'm not going to invent a new quantum algorithm, but maybe I can think of a way to do something with an existing one. I think that if quantum computers can ever be made to scale, the first commercially relevant applications will be in quantum chemistry. What you calculate for those applications are properties of molecules, like how stable they are, how readily they react with other substances, what their optical and electric properties are, and so forth. If you could calculate this before or you try to synthesize a molecule in the lab, this could speed up the discovery of new fertilizers, drugs, batteries, solar panels, and so on. I'm guessing this will be the first application because estimates say that for quantum chemistry, you need the smallest number of qubits to come into a range where conventional computers can no longer cope. One application that could be optimized with a quantum computer could be, for example, artificial photosynthesis. I find that interesting because we know that photosynthesis relies on quantum something. Indeed, there have been several studies to find ways to put processes of plant photosynthesis on a quantum computer. But why not use a quantum computer to instead find the most efficient way to artificially reproduce photosynthesis? Hey, sign me up! No, wait, let's first look at the details. Among the first applications, they'll pick 20 teams. Among those, they'll divide up the first million. That's 1 million divided by 20, so 50,000 per team to work out their idea. And then there'll be 3 million divided up among the first three winners, and the remaining million will be split up among the runners-up. That's very little money for a research project. Basically, this is only interesting for already existing research teams who have the funding already. And this makes me think that the only thing this prize will unearth is more of the same from the same people. If I was handing out a prize for quantum computing, I'd ask people to submit plans for scaling up quantum computers of any technology with technological requirements and cost estimates, and would give the prize to whoever comes up with the most feasible and and realistic plan. Because yes, I've seen such plans from one or the other lab, but I don't believe a word they say. But let's not be cynical. Hello. Hi, Elon. Well, if quantum computing research keeps theoretical physicists away from Wall Street, that also benefits society. Do I win something? I wouldn't dare making fun of you. Talk soon. Electric vehicles are a key element of the global transition away from fossil fuels. This is why in the past year, several European countries have trialed electric highways. Those have power lines above one lane from which test vehicles can charge while driving. Some of those trials have now been concluded and the result has been unexpectedly controversial. Let's have a look. The electric highways are built especially for trucks. You here see footage of one that's on the way from the Frankfurt airport to Heidelberg, where we live. They are meant to address the issue that trucks are difficult to power with batteries because the batteries have to be huge or they need to be recharged frequently. Recharging the battery on the way is a clever solution. The trucks in these trials all had diesel engines in addition to the batteries, so the idea was to bring down the diesel consumption. As you can see in this footage, the electric highways have two power lines instead of just one, as you have above railroads. This is because to charge the battery, the current doesn't just need to get in, it needs to go through. In an electrically powered train, the current goes through the wheels and into the tracks and the ground. That doesn't work for trucks with rubber tires on asphalt, so you need two power lines. The two power lines are somewhat of an engineering challenge because you need to have a steady connection with both lines on somewhat uneven ground because a highway is not a railroad. But it's not rocket science and some clever engineers built these things in several places starting 2018 and 2019. We now have results from several of these projects 
projects in Germany and a recent report looked at the project near the Frankfurt airport in particular. They measure that when the truck was hooked up to the power line, the diesel consumption dropped on average from typically 30 liters per 100 kilometers to more like three or four liters. That's a drop by almost a factor 10. If the vehicle was entirely battery powered, the consumption would be zero or through. That sounds pretty remarkable, but remember that all that energy still needs to come from somewhere. And Germany's energy at the moment still comes from 50% fossil fuels. That's supposed to improve, though no one knows exactly how, but that's another story. Well, so for this report, they took the optimistic estimate to 2030 and looked at how much carbon dioxide one could save this way, and they came up with something like roughly 40%. For the case when the truck is entirely electric, you can reduce emissions by about 60%. And this is better than all other methods that they looked at, such as hydrogen or synthetic fuels. Indeed, synthetic fuels, according to this estimate, are actually worse than just running the thing on diesel. We're working on a long video about e-fuels, but it keeps getting longer and longer. To me, this actually looks pretty good. But this project has been extremely controversial and received some very bad press. And I understand why. I've driven on that e-highway hundreds of times since the project started and never saw a single truck using it. This is because there have been only 11 trucks in total using it. According to the new report, the companies who participated in the trial all liked it, but then again they didn't have to pay for it. Who paid for this was the taxpayer. And this is why this project got so controversial. It's taking up a whopping 190 million euro for barely a 20 kilometer stretch. Now, to be fair, much of this was development cost and for the scientific evaluation, etc. But the cost for the electric installation and the necessary highway adjustments alone come to about 2 million per kilometer. Now, according to this recent paper, which just appeared last week, the total e-highway network in Europe would have to be about 12,000 kilometers. That would be about 24 billion euros just to put the cables on the road. And that doesn't address the question of where all that energy is supposed to come from or who'd be building all these trucks. So the major issue with the idea isn't that it doesn't work. It's that it's expensive. Some companies are working instead on producing vehicles whose batteries can be swapped rather than having to charge them. And personally, this looks like a better solution to me. One might also wonder why we don't just make better use of the already existing electronic highway, otherwise known as railway. In case you've been wondering too, you'll enjoy this. Some railway companies in the UK have stopped using electrically powered trains and go back to using diesel engines because electricity in the UK is just too expensive. Indeed, electricity prices in Europe are the highest in the world and are even higher in Germany than in the UK. And this will eventually kill the idea of the e-highway because so long as diesel is cheaper than electricity, no one will use it anyway. It's a shame. I actually like the idea. Well, I guess we'll just have to build bigger wormholes in quantum computers and then shove the trucks through. I've been fascinated for years by the idea that randomness can improve computer calculations. I've also been terribly confused by it. I think I've now sorted it out. There are three different ways in which randomness can help computation. The first one is noisy computation, then there's stochastic computation, and then there's probabilistic computation. And those are three different things. Let's have a look. Random numbers are a resource for many computations. You use them when you don't know exactly what you're dealing with. That might be because data is uncertain, or you don't have the data, or you know you have unknown unknowns that make random perturbations. Calculations that use random numbers are basically everywhere in financial management, climate models, artificial intelligence, you name it. But computers weren't meant to do random things. So what one normally does is to take what's called a pseudo random number generator. These are deterministic algorithms that produce numbers that look for all practical purposes random. For example, you can pick some digits of pi star 
starting at a position that you seed from the exact time of the day. But that takes up computational power and that seems somewhat unnecessary. There's so much randomness around us, why not use something of that? And indeed, the first application of noise in computing is to provide that randomness. These devices are known as true random number generators or hardware random number generators. They exploit various sources of noise. Some are quantum in nature, such as electronic noise. Others come from non-quantum chaos or metastable systems. These have been in use for about 10 years. And while they have been implemented here and there, especially for cryptographic protocols, researchers are only now beginning to explore what else this noise could be good for. For example, one can use the noise in circuits not just to produce random numbers, but to change how the circuits operate. At low levels of noise, they might behave very predictably. At intermediate levels, very randomly. And at high levels, they become more predictable again, because noise tends to amplify some processes and drowns out others. But they operate differently at high noise than at low noise. Basically, turning up and down the noise level allows you to create circuits that can switch from one mode to another. Just exactly what that's good for, I guess we'll see when the thing demands that we call it hell. This brings me to the second point, stochastic computing. Stochastic computing is a different way of calculating with bit strings. Usually in a computer, we use a bit string to represent a number. In stochastic computing, one uses a bit string to represent the probability of a truth value. For this, one only counts the number of zeros and ones in the string, but the position doesn't matter. Say you have the string 0100, that would be 25% true, 75% false. The thing is now that if you have two bit strings of the same length representing different probabilities and you multiply multiply them bit by bit, then the result has the right probability automatically. That's to say, if you repeat this for many bit strings representing your probabilities, then you average the results, you get the right answer. Here's the simplest possible example. Suppose we want to multiply 50% times 50% with two bit strings. If you randomly pick, then the 50% could be represented by either 0, 1 or 1, 0. This means we have four possible results. Now we read these results again as probabilities and take the average. I got tired and asked ChatGPT, which said the result is a probability of 137.5%. So, um, Let's better do this ourselves. I get 2 times 50% plus 2 times 0% divided by 4, which is 25%. And this is correct. It works for any length of the string and any probability. The reason for doing this is that this type of multiplication is fast and easy. It saves time and energy. The downside is that the length of the string determines how accurate your probabilities are. This means if you want very accurate results, you need long strings and you need to sample them a lot, which makes the computations more energy intensive again. This is why stochastic computing, even though the idea has been around since the 1940s, is barely being used today. However, things are changing. This is because stochastic computing could be a great energy saver in cases where you don't need high accuracy. This is why it's presently being considered for the Internet of Things that are devices with tags that tell you where they are and how they're doing. Maybe if your fridge knows that you're out of milk with 99% probability, that's good enough. The third way of using randomness is probabilistic computation. For this, one uses hardware that's especially suited to solving certain optimization problems. Suppose I ask you to calculate the sounding modes of a square plate. Ugh, you might say, go away. Okay, but instead of doing the calculation, you could sprinkle sand on the plate and put a speaker underneath it. What's happening? The sound puts the plate into motion and makes the sand randomly jump around. But where the plate doesn't move much, there's not much jumping. So in those areas, the sand piles up. These are the optimal places for the sand to be. And those optimal places answer your question. There's your standing mode. Probabilistic computing works based on the same idea. You want to find an optimal state as the solution. And for that, you configure a system so that its optimal state answers your question. You might not 
be all that interested in square plates. But similar optimization problems can be found everywhere in real life. That's task scheduling, route and fleet optimization, airplane boarding, supply chain optimization, package delivery, seed plants, taxi timing, you name it. Even solving Sudoku puzzles is an optimization problem. For a probabilistic computer, you now use a system that has an energetically preferred state and you encode your question into that state. You apply some randomness and then you let the system relax into that ground state. The most commonly used system is known as the Ising model. In this model, individual states have a spin and they couple to each other in ways that you specify. This type of computing goes under the name annealing because it's very similar to what happens in some crystals where the term had previously been used. Yes, that's the same annealing which D-Wave does, except they use quantum annealing where one also has entanglement between the spins. Since the entanglement is very fragile, these computers need to be cooled to near absolute zero. It's a type of probabilistic computation where the randomness is provided by quantum effects. You get more punch out of it because of the entanglement, but that has the downside of needing this extensive cooling. You don't need the entanglement. However, you can do annealing without quantum anything. In that case, you need another source for the randomness. For this, you can take one of the two random number generators. But then, in contrast to quantum annealing, you can make that work at room temperature. There's been loads of work on this in the past years, and these non-quantum annealing chips are actually quite impressive. The currently largest one comes from Tokyo University. Their prototype has 4096 coupled spins and they just published test results. They compared the performance of their chip with that of a conventional computer on which you simulate what the chip does. For this, they used a benchmark test called the max cut problem. The task is to try and cut a network into two so that one cuts the maximum number of links. Their annealing chip used merely 2.9 watts, whereas the standard computer used 200 watts. And it took about 1000 seconds, where the standard computer took almost an hour. That's amazing. Several other companies are working on similar chips, for example, Toshiba and Fujitsu. The issue with the annealing chips is similar to quantum computers in that they don't scale easily. You can't just lump several of them together and get a bigger one. That doesn't work. The other issue is that our example with the square plate illustrates they need the right level of noise. If the noise is too low, the sound doesn't jump and you're not optimizing anything. If the noise is too high, you never find the optimal state. All of this might make you wonder now if noise is so useful, why are the quantum computing people stressing out so much about it? Why don't they just use it? The reason is that to use noise, you need to know what the noise is doing. And they have no idea what's up with the noise in their quantum computers, which is interesting in itself, don't you think? These examples of using randomness in computing are part of a more general trend that we're seeing, which is that we're going away from all purpose architecture to having specialized hardware for different tasks. It's like the industrial revolution is coming to integrated circuits. Next thing you you know, integrated circuits will form labor unions and ask for health insurance. Hyperjumps, wormholes and warp drives sound like science fiction. And for the most part, they are. But what makes them so interesting is that they're not entirely science fiction. They're based on real science. I think that of the three, warp drives are by far the most plausible. And today I want to tell you about a new way of analyzing and visualizing warp drives. Let's have a look. A team of several physicists just put out a new paper in which they present a numerical simulation of warp drives of which you see an example here. This gray bubble in the middle is the passenger area and the envelope around it shows you how space transports momentum to move the passenger 
capsule forward. The code is openly available on GitHub called Warp Factory and it'll make it much easier for anyone to study the physics of warp drives. But just exactly what do we see in this animation? It's a solution of Einstein's general relativity, which is a really weird theory. We hear so much about the weirdness of quantum mechanics, but honestly, I think general relativity is much weirder, and Albert agrees. To begin with, general relativity is a nonlinear theory, and in contrast to quantum mechanics, it can be chaotic. But its main feature is that it tells us that space and also time can stretch, expand, deform, and even close back on themselves. And this has some really odd consequences. General relativity, for example, tells us that space can have wormholes in which two points that seem very distant to us are connected by a very short path. That's the wormhole. And yes, you could use that for interstellar travel. But the problem with wormholes is that general relativity also says they're unstable and close on their own. And even if we knew how to fix that problem, which we don't, there's still the issue that to get somewhere through a wormhole, you'd need it to be connected to a place you actually want to go. And how do you make that happen? This is why I've never been excited about wormholes. Hyperdrives are even less plausible because they need additional dimensions of space that, for all we know, don't exist. And that leaves warp drives. Warp drives make use of two particularly odd features of general relativity. One is that energy conservation can be violated, and the other is that space itself can beat the speed of light limit. Yes, that's right. While stuff inside of space can't go faster than the speed of light, space itself doesn't have any such restriction. And so the idea of the warp drive is that rather than traveling through space, you can track the space in front of you and expand it behind you, which moves you forward. And that can, in principle, so the idea, exceed the speed of light. In the past 30 years, several physicists have put maths behind these words, and there are now an increasing number of solutions to general relativity that describe such a warp drive. The animations you see here are ways to visualize what's happening in these solutions. I've talked about this several times before, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, but it is important that you know what this means and doesn't mean. In general relativity, the distribution and motion of mass and energy must fit to the curvature of space-time. This is what Einstein's equations tell you. On the left side, you have the curvature of space and time. On the right side, you have all kinds of energy. And it's an equality, so the two have to fit together. But that you have a solution to general relativity just means that you can write down some curvature for space that fits to some distribution of mass and energy. It doesn't tell you whether that distribution of mass and energy is actually physically possible. And that's the issue with all the current warp drives. Sure, they exist mathematically, but no one knows how to build them because we don't have the stuff to create the required curvature. That said, maybe there are ways to build them with the normal stuff around us, we just haven't figured out how. This then brings up the problem that the maths of general relativity is hard to deal with, and that's where the new project, the Warp Factory, comes in. It gives everyone a way to numerically analyze what's going on by solving the equations of general relativity using code. Now, I want to be honest with you, I don't think anyone's going to build a warp drive within the next 1,000 years or so. If you look at the maths closely, it turns out that if you want to go faster than light, you basically need to chuck out stuff with negative energy, which for all we know doesn't exist. And even if you stay below the speed of light, the maths doesn't tell you how you get the stuff to move the way it needs to. It looks to me suspiciously like moving the stuff would require some sort of propulsion system, which makes the entire idea kind of pointless. Then again, maybe I'm getting old and lack imagination, and every 1,000-year journey must start with the first step. So if you feel like you're destined to be the first to build a warp drive, you might want to check out this paper. Do you sometimes feel like nothing can surprise you anymore? This is why I read science news, because last week I came across a paper that says we owe our existence to gravitational waves. Really? 
We had to build an apparatus measuring several kilometers in size to measure them, and they are supposed to have had some influence on the origin of life. No way. Let's have a look. So this paper definitely gets a prize for a catchy title, but the content is somewhat drier than the title suggests. In a nutshell, the argument is this. Atoms are the building blocks of life, except cats who are made of magic. But where do they come from? The atoms, not the cats. The lighter ones were created in the very early universe and then drifted around as gas clouds for a few hundred million years or so, which is how I begin my Monday mornings too. But the gas clouds eventually begin to clump and form stars. The enormous gravitational pressure within stars causes nuclear fusion and that subsequently creates heavier elements. When stars go supernova, they spit out the heavier elements. These accumulate in the remaining gas clouds, which then form new stars and potentially planets around them. And these planets now have some of the heavier elements too. However, the fusion process in stars is only efficient up to iron. So where do the really heavy elements come from? Astrophysicists currently believe that most of the really heavy elements that we find on Earth were created in neutron star mergers. When these neutron stars collide with each other, that creates enormous pressure. And that, so the idea, creates the really heavy elements, including gold and platinum, explaining why we have billionaires and indeed all the way up to plutonium. I guess we'd all miss plutonium, but we could probably live without it. Then again, some of those really heavy elements are essential for our health. For example, iodine. We need iodine to produce thyroid hormones that are necessary for growth regulation. The argument in the new paper is now that if it wasn't for gravitational waves, neutron star mergers would be incredibly unlikely. This is because usually neutron stars merge after they've been orbiting each other for a long time. They spiral into each other because, here it comes, gravitational waves carry away energy. We know this both from some direct observations of rotation periods that speed up as time goes by and from detections of the gravitational waves emitted from the merger in the last few seconds. The authors now claim that these neutron star mergers, made possible by gravitational waves, have provided about 96% of the iodine on Earth and all of the thorium and uranium too. Okay, so it's not like the paper's wrong, but the argument is a stretch if there's ever been one. That the human thyroid gland needs iodine hardly means that life wouldn't have been possible some other way. Basically, I think the title of the paper is an excuse to calculate some probabilities of nuclear fusion processes, and I doubt it'll survive peer review. That said, the paper falls into a genre of similar studies known as anthropic arguments. The word anthropic comes from the Greek word for human and the purpose of these arguments is to find out just what was and wasn't necessary for life to emerge on our planet or in the universe in general. The idea is that this tells us something about the type of natural laws that we must observe because otherwise we wouldn't be here to see it. This is known as the anthropic principle. A famous example is the seemingly unlikely resonance of an isotope of carbon that's carbon-12. This resonance is necessary for nuclear fusion in stars to create as much carbon as we see around us. And for carbon, there's indeed a fair argument to make that it's somehow essential to life, though I'm still not quite convinced, but then I'm one of those nastily stubborn people. There are many other examples, like the small mass difference between protons and neutrons that keeps atoms stable, or that the cosmological constant hasn't ripped apart stars before they could form, or that the moon has about the same apparent size as the sun in the sky, which some scientists, I do not kid you, have argued was also necessary for life to rise on our planet. Some people think these seemingly unlikely coincidences are evidence of a creator. So should we now add gravitational waves to the list of things that prove the existence of God? 
Well, I'd say that science can neither prove nor disprove the existence of a creator who pulled strings behind the scenes. If it could, then that creator would just be another part of nature and not supernatural. But that the universe we inhabit is such a friendly and welcoming place to life is certainly something that makes me wonder if not we're missing some part of the picture. Maybe the laws of nature aren't part what they are, because that would allow for life to rise. I see no logic reason why that couldn't be the case and sometimes I worry that scientists are dismissing this idea somewhat too quickly. Then again, whether it's right or wrong that the universe is in one way or another ideal for life, in practice it's rarely been a useful idea. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.